Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Leaders Lunch at YourNeighbor.org. We've partnered with World Vision and New Wine for this event, and I'm delighted to have uh, Graham from World Vision interviewing Mark Mellewish on leading yourself and keeping fresh under pressure. Graham will interview and introduce Mark shortly. It's been wonderful to work with World Vision this week, and we've been focusing on mental health. We had an amazing panel yesterday with experts from around the world sharing their experiences and we'll paste the link in the chat now for the video. Graham Newton came to the UK from New Zealand in 2010 with his wife Susanna and three children and they live actually a stone's throw away from me. I'm in Bedford and they're in Amptill and in Bedfordshire and are members of Amptill Baptist Church and are involved in the young adults ministry there. He's been with World Vision for 15 years, five years in New Zealand, and the past 10 years doing a variety of roles here at World Vision UK. He's currently the Director of Public Engagement, which includes looking after World Vision's work with churches. Outside of work, he, he's, a big, he's big on sport and adventure, and obviously being from New Zealand is a passionate rugby fan. Um, thank you so much to everyone for joining us this lunchtime. For those of you who don't know about YourNeighbor.org, we're a network of over 1,300 churches across the UK to help them care for their communities in crisis. And this includes us running a helpline, connecting people who need help with local churches and specialist teams who can help them, supporting church leaders through webinars and training and leaders' lunches like this, uh, and also um, equipping churches to work with local and national government at this time. So one of the projects we've been working on in the past few weeks has been around food poverty and children. And we've been working with churches around the country to help them build partnerships with um, primary schools in the most deprived areas. And we've been doing that with TLG, with Love Your Neighbour, the Message Trust and Salvation Army in a project called Lockdown Hunger. And we also launched a toolkit last week for how churches can work well with their local government and do check out the link that will should be appearing in the chat now for our engaging locally toolkit, yourneighbor.org forward slash engaging hyphen locally. We love telling stories of what churches are doing through and beyond COVID. So do please get in touch with us at welcome at yourneighbor.org if you'd like to be profiled. We've done a number of leaders lunches, including with Nikki Gumbel, Chris Vallotton, the Bishop of Durham, Sarah Jackson, Jeff Lucas and Marvin Rees, the mayor of Bristol. And as I said earlier, I'm delighted that we're doing this with World Vision and New Wine. And we're going to have about 30 minutes of an interview with Graham and Mark. And then Graham and Mark are going to say a few words about both what World Vision and New Wine are up to at the moment. And we're going to open it up for questions. So if you do have a question, please can you private message me, Dom Llewellyn, in the chat. And we'll try and ask, um, we'll try and ask Graham and Mark as many questions as possible. And we'll be finished by 1.30. We're in for a treat this lunchtime. So without any further ado, I'd love to hand over to Graham Newton. Well, thanks so much, Dom. And uh, a very good afternoon to each of you on this lovely summer's day today. Uh, just looking at the screen here, a number of friendly faces I know um, and a bunch of people I don't. So just a warm welcome to each of you. Um, as Dom said, I'm also really looking forward to this time. I'm really looking forward to hearing from Mark and learning from Mark. And I'm sure each of us have, uh, have grown uh, both personally, professionally and spiritually through this really unprecedented time of, of challenge that we're facing at the moment. And uh, to have someone like Mark here today to share his story with us is a real, real blessing. So Mark, I want to just first of all to say thank you uh, for, for being open to be part of this today and for sharing and encouraging us. Well, you're very kind. You're very kind, Graham. I I feel the pressure already. <laughs> Good. I was hoping for that. Before we kick off, Mark, I, I wonder, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Tell us about your family. Tell us about your work. Tell us about the ministry that you are involved in. Um, okay. So, um, really, I'm just a church leader. That's basically who I am. I mean, my most important um, role in life is that I'm married to Lindsay. We've been married for 37 years, I think. Um, and um, I have five children and one son-in-law and one granddaughter. Um, uh, I am a passionate rugby fan. I'm a 
passionate cyclist. I go out cycling if I can several times a week. Um, uh, I'm also involved, I've been involved in the leadership of New Wine for 30 years. Um, so quite a long time. I've done New Wine New Zealand and South Africa and Canada and America and um, uh, France and Germany and I've been around different places. We're, we're, we've been very blessed. Um, my biggest passion at the moment is seeing younger leaders step up to what God is calling them to do. And um, yeah, so that, that's me. I'm, I'm, uh, but basically, I, I lead a local church. Well, I, we have a family of churches, so we've planted a few out. We've networked with others locally. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. To kick us off um, with uh, questions here, I wonder if you could just tell us what is a leader's greatest priority? Um, it's, it's really it's a great question because I think that um, Jesus demonstrated something really significant when he wrapped a towel around his waist and talked about servant leadership. And um, uh, that means that we can quickly get into the role of thinking we've got to get busy serving others. But I actually think the leader's greatest priority is serving yourself so that you can serve others. Here's what I see in Jesus' life, is that he retreated often. He prioritized time with his father. He put the, the foundations in place in his life that he might serve others. So for me, the, the leadership's greatest, the leader's greatest challenge and priority is about leading oneself. And it's not about, so it's not just about self-leadership, but it's, it's about working on the inward stuff in our lives. Um, and um, if we don't work on the inward stuff, we get knocked off course by the outward stuff. So we have to ask the question, what is God saying to me at the moment about me? And also, what is God saying at the moment about the current situation, wherever it might be worldwide? What is God talking to us about? And that is something that takes time and um, uh, deep reflection, um, I think. Um, and it helps us to prioritise those things that we should do. So practice, putting in, practicing good habits, those things that we need to do to um, stay healthy as a leader, that we might be available for others. Um, I mean, there's, there's lots more I could say on it, but, but I think that much of self-care is about having the discipline to do the right thing and not the most pressing thing. And sometimes the right thing is not to do what is being asked of you immediately by those around you or pushed under your nose through constant emails, but about saying, no, this is what the Lord's asking me to do because there's a, a longer term plan. There's a longer calling that we have at the moment that we are supposed to be involved in. So remembering who we are as individuals and, um, focusing on encountering God ourselves, that we might enable others to encounter God. Whether that be through the handing out of a, a cup of water, or a, a, a bag of food, whatever it might be, or whether that just might be by sitting and listening or praying, or our role, our role I believe as leaders is to take people to the Lord and not just to be the the, the first aid um, answer to people, but to be those who answer the deeper questions in life, to give people the strength and the support they need to be able to cope with whatever's coming their way. So lead us highest priority, lead yourself well and put in good practices. Um, and there's lots of things I could say on putting in good practices, but I, I mean, I think those are the key things that I would say uh, we should be focused on. Thanks, Mark. And what, it, what do you think are some of the key things that we all need in place as Christians to continue to grow in our relationship with God? Um, 
I'd say, um, besides, I, I'd say finding a place of silence and solitude yourselves. One of the things that this current time, this lockdown has, has highlighted is we found out those who are able to lead themselves or to feed themselves and those who rely on others to feed them. So um, those who say, you know, we, we need to return to church or we need to have this or we need to have that, that, that there's, a, there's, a, there's like a group of those. And there are others who might say, no, I found some, I found some really precious holy moments in this time. And um, uh, I think that being people who practice silence and solitude um, who practice something of the presence of God in our lives is, um, is, is really significant. So for me, that would be what I'd be uh, saying to people, pra prioritize those things. I'd say also prioritize staying connected with friends and family because um, uh, all work and no play makes us very dull people. And, um, uh, being people who ensure that we connect with others and we, we get other people's perspectives into our lives. And it, it helps us keep, um, uh, keep a tabs on what we're doing. And, and I'd also say manage your time well. Absolutely key. Um, otherwise, we wear ourselves out. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, um, in World Vision, we have a, a psychosocial first aid program, and it starts with encouraging leaders to look after themselves. So a little bit about what you've been talking about here, but I wonder just what words of encouragement that you would share with us as leaders to help us practice self-care? Oh, I think, you know, I think that's a, a lovely question, Graham. I think that... Um, uh, what, one of my daily practices is to sit in a chair on my own in an upright position, focused on a passage of scripture. And so I read a passage several times until I find a word in that passage where God speaks to me. Um, and then to ensure I've taken half an hour, maybe a bit longer, just to practice presence of God on a daily basis. Um, I think that's, I think it's key to who we are and what we do. Um, it helps, um, shape everything else in the day. Um, uh, I think that, uh, understanding, um, that you're first of all a child of God before you're a servant to anybody else, um, it, it equips us to be better um disciples of christ in what we're doing so 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 be people who 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 practice that who put that in place be people who who um uh, uh, don't feel guilty at looking after yourselves uh, i think that one of the greatest problems of leaders or those who um look to be in leadership is that we feel the pressure that other people put on us um, and often leaders live with a real sense of guilt in their lives i should be doing this or i should be doing that or people are asking me to do this actually the greatest gift you can give anybody else is your personal walk with christ it's the greatest gift you have to offer so practice good time management practice physical health, practice good diet, practice good screen time. One of the biggest problems that people have is, is actually spending too much time on screens looking at what everybody else is doing. Um, whereas, you know, practice switching it off, letting it go, you know, walk, going for walks, enjoying nature. Then you come back refreshed and you're able to give out to others. Excellent, thank you. Mark, now we know that this season has brought so many challenges for, for each of us and many people are working from home and facing all sorts of different pressure. What do you think causes the most pressure in our lives, especially linked to our mental health? 
I think probably the thing that brings most pressure, um, and I say this carefully, is probably social media. Um, it's, it, it's up there in the top grouping. Um, I think many leaders look at what other people are doing and think I should be doing or I should be following or I should be. Um, I, I have, I learned a long time ago that I can only do what I can do. Um, and I can't emulate everybody else. So we've got to find out what God's calling us to do. Um, uh, comparison itis. I don't know if there is such a word, but I think that it is something that most people struggle with. Um, uh, oh, that organization is doing that, or that church is doing that, or that leader is doing that. You know, um, the truth is that every church leader is doing an outstanding job in the context in which they're operating. And um, not every church can run a food bank. Not every church can run a soup kitchen. Not every church can do emergency aid. Not every church. You know, we've got to look at what we've got. And, and might, we might say, well, actually, at the moment, the best thing our church can do is to look after those in our care and encourage people to look after their neighbours. Literally, that's what we can do. If you're doing that, you're doing a, you're doing a great job. It's finding what God has called you to um, and not looking at others and thinking, well, they're doing it. Therefore, I, I should be doing it, because what that means is that we we struggle within our own lives. The, the, the next thing I'd say is um, what no, don't just watch your social media input, but what's your news input. Um, I used to wake up and. Um, I'm quite a, a BBC News addict, so I look at the news all the time. I want to know what's going on. And, and particularly at the beginning of this season, you know, what, what are the governments saying? What can we do? What can't we do? There are so many questions going through our minds. And what I found was by the time I'd read the news and got out of bed, I was depressed before the day had started. And of course, I had less to give to others. So I stopped reading the news. My son actually challenged me on it. We, one of my boys is living at home at the moment. He's at university. And so he's with us. And, and he just said to me one dinner time, he said, Dad, you've got to stop looking at the news. It's, it's messing you up. So I did stop. And um, instead of looking at the news first thing in the morning, I always did. My, I, Lindsay and I, we start every day with reading the Bible together, praying together. Um, talking about the day together, going through, we've got a little prayer journal that we use. Um, but um, I would wake up an hour before she did. I still do. <laughs> I would, and I would then read the news for an hour. Now I don't. Now I wake up before she does and I make myself a cup of tea and I sit quietly and pray. And I start the day well. And I think if you start the day well, it, it changes that the rest of the day and you think well I, I can't do what they're doing but I can do what God's called me to and it brings a an inner peace to our hearts so <laughs> I, I, as one looks around the country one sees different churches doing the most amazing things you know best thing you can do is celebrate what they're doing and knowing that what you're doing is contributing something towards that, that greater picture. And what you're doing is just as important as what they're doing. So what's your media input? What's your news input? Think about what you're feeding yourself with that you might feed others from a healthy place in your own life. Such a, uh, encouragement and such practical help for us, uh, for us all there, Mark. Thank you. You mentioned earlier about the need to feed yourself and look after yourself rather than being dependent on others. And I'm interested to know how you have done that yourself. So what have you been reading, watching, listening that has continued to feed you uh, over this season? Uh, well, I've got a book here. This is um, called Strengthening the Soul of Leadership. This is a great book. It's by Ruth Haley Barton, 
and um, uh, seeking God in the crucible of ministry. Um, really terrific, actually, for me. Um, that's one of the ones I've been reading. Um, because you're a New Zealander, I'll admit to reading this. This is um, James Kerr Legacy, which is all about the All Blacks. And um, that's a great book on leadership, actually. Um, what the All Blacks can teach us about the business of life. It's, um, it's, it's a brilliant book, a dead easy uh, read. Um, I encourage people with that. And another one for me, this is another one by Ruth Haley Barton. And this is The Invitation to Silence and Solitude. And um, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. And it talks about experiencing God's transforming presence. And so for me, going back over those um, uh, really key things that um, uh, I've enjoyed. And of course, I've got my prayer journal. So this is key for me, and I take it with me everywhere. And when someone says, you know, would you pray for me? I'm able to write their name in here. Um, I, I try and sometimes sneakily take a picture of them so I can remember their face um, and put a, a, a name to it. But I would then write their name in my prayer journal. And then every day I've got a list of people and subjects and things I'm going to pray for. And also listening to what God is speaking to me about. So, um, yeah, there, there are some of the things that I, I put in place. I, I, I also um, I practice um, uh, exercise every day, Graham, if I can. So if I can get out on my bike, I try and get out. On a Saturday, we'll do a longer run, so I'll ride about 100K. Midweek, I'll do a couple of 50Ks. But if I can't get out on my bike, I'll do sit-ups and press-ups and or a walk. Last night, I did a walk. I didn't... That was Tuesday yesterday, wasn't it? I did do I did 50K in the morning, but last night, I went out for a walk as well. We've loved walking in this season. We walk around our whole neighbourhood and look at everybody's front gardens and see what's going on. It's been great. And then come back and think we really must do something about our front garden. So, uh, it, it, you know, it, but doing that sort of thing every day enables us to, to have different, a different focus. And I, I walk with um, uh, my wife and son, which is lovely. So we talk and walk. Um, and and, and I, I absolutely love cooking. And uh, we're exploring cooking and what cooking means. And so I cook three times a week. My son cooks twice a week and my wife cooks as well. And we, so we, we, do, we do food together and it's great fun. So that, it's just a way of staying healthy, I think, isn't it? And um, uh, some of the things that I've put in place. But another thing that I practice, Graham, is that I practice separating my... Um, personal walk with God from my public walk with God. By that I mean um, don't mix those two things up. First of all in my life I'm a child of the living God. I wasn't brought up as a Christian. Um, I was very jealous of the relationship that my friend had with, he's still, he's still one of my best mates, and he had in his home with his parents. I used to go and stay there and his, as a teenager and his father would come in at night. If I was staying there the night, his father would come in and he would say, right, boys, I'm going to pray with you. And I think, well, what, what's all this about? You know, as a teenager, I used to think it was a lot of nonsense. But what I did know was that I was very jealous of the relationship they had and there's something different in their lives. And um, I had the honour of being part of my mate's father's funeral a few years ago. And it was, it was he carrying the presence of God that led me to want to find the presence of God. And he didn't do anything except practice something of uh, the weight and majesty of God in his life. And I think if we can find that in our lives, that leads us to action. And 
and listen, World Vision, phenomenal action. Uh, the, the whole your neighbor org is for phenomenal action but but it, it's got to be action that comes from hasn't it? it comes from something why do we do it and for me it comes from a place of practicing the beauty of the presence of god in our lives on a daily basis that we have something deep and meaningful to offer with others that was a long answer Probably, uh, sorry, Graham. I, I'm terrible. Thanks. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm resisting the temptation to ask you what your favourite recipes might be or favourite uh, type of food to cook, but uh, we can come on to that later. Maybe <laughs> I would admit to be slightly intimidated by 100 kilometre bike rides at the weekend. And just... oh, you are not. Come on, Graham. Come on, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, you you talk about. Uh, where the motivation comes from for our service and, and World Vision is, is founded on a prayer that the prayer from our founder Bob Pierce Let my heart be broken by the things which break the heart of God yeah. I wonder Mark if you could just tell us maybe what your heart is for the church and their leaders throughout the season Yeah, do you know my my heart is that people will hear the Lord speak to them um, I think there's a there's a great danger that we go from where we are at the moment um, into um, action and, and, and busyness. Um, and I just wonder, you know, the churches, the churches across this country have been sort of closed. It's, it, I mean, they haven't been closed. The most phenomenal work is going on. In fact, the church is probably more active and doing many different things than it's done for a long time because we're not focused on on the event on a Sunday or whatever it might be. Um, and um, my, my prayer for people is that they uh, would know a peace in their hearts to be able to hear the Lord for the next season. I, I believe that there's a, I think the Lord has been speaking to me, you know, the John 21 when, when uh, Jesus has died and, um, uh, the disciples have seen him buried and he's risen again he's appeared to the disciples and i don't think they could interpret that appearance because um uh, i mean who would interpret that i mean they've got no framework for that and uh shortly after that we get that's john 20 shortly after that john 21 peter peter says i'm going fishing it's like he returns to that that he knew because he doesn't understand that that's going on. And I think we don't necessarily understand what's going on at the moment. Um, I actually think we've had three pandemics. I think we've got the pandemic of climate change. Uh, Greta Thunberg, how did a 14 year old girl become a household name around the world without something of the wind of the spirit in that? Maybe God was shouting to us. We've got our current health pandemic Climate change is all about how we've mistreated this world. The health pandemic is how we've mistreated the things of this world. And then the third one, how did George Floyd's name become a household name? You know, people have been brutally murdered in terrible ways for many years. And all of a sudden, one name comes up. Maybe God is speaking to us at the moment about justice. Justice for the world justice for each other you know uh, isaiah 58 this is the type of fasting the lord wants you share your clothes with the hungry and you share your your your, your food with the hungry and your clothes with those who need them this is i think that god is speaking to us and then racial justice that we would we would be churches who reflect more of the heart of god in the way in which we are and you know Graham, I, I don't think we, I don't think we know these things unless we stop, unless we, we practice stopping and, and saying, Lord, what are you saying? So my prayer for leaders is that they'd interpret the times. And when the disciples are out fishing, they get a voice from the shore. Guys, have you caught anything? They say, no, we haven't caught anything. We've been fishing all night. Jesus calls them and says, well, throw your nets on the other side. 
And um, uh, I, as they do, you know the story that we, they, they get a mighty catch. And I, I think what God's asking us to do is throw our nets on the other side. To re reimagine church, not just reopen. To rethink ministry. Um, to rethink structures and leadership. And to be people who uh, find uh, God's voice for the way forward. And I, I think if we can do that in this time, we'll end up with healthier, more mature churches that are more racially diverse, that have a greater heart for the poor, and that, that are leaders in the answer to climate change. And if, 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 and it's a big if, listen, because I, I, I would never say thus saith the Lord, because I, I wouldn't know, but, but if, if there's a soupçon of, of um, truth in what I think the Lord is saying, the church rising up to the, the, the plea of justice in the world, we will, see, we will see God's grace poured out as we've never seen it poured out before. And I believe that the catch will be vast. John 15, you know, the, the vine, the fruit and the vine. This is, what, this is what Jesus does. He says, God prunes the healthy branches that they be more fruitful. And I think maybe the Lord's pruned us. He stopped us. And we've got to come back healthier. So my prayer for leaders is, is guys, try, men and women, try and hear what the Lord's saying for this new season. Because if we can find that, if we can find that, the churches that we lead, the, the partnerships that we're part of, will be richer and deeper and more meaningful going forward. Graham, I'm terribly sorry, my answers seem to be terribly long. These are very bad, aren't they, really? Uh, forgive me for that. Uh, uh, it's, it's a fantastic answer, Mark. I, I, I personally feel very both encouraged and challenged by that. And, and uh, I think if you'd asked me four months ago, what would life be like if you uh, had to go into lockdown and stay at home with your family and work with your family and, and see your church and your workplace closed down essentially for, for the next five months, you would think I'm going to have an abundance of time. I'm going to be looking for things to do. And I think what many of us are feeling is actually an intensification of activity in our lives. Yeah. Um, and in many ways, this has been a severe disruption, but it's also been an incredible opportunity for each of us, our work, our churches, our communities, to be able to be uh, more fruitful and, and effective in what we're doing. But I'm so encouraged, and I do feel so challenged by that, that absolute need to remove ourselves from the intensity of life and to, uh, to, to ensure that we are enjoying time in God's presence, that we're being fed, our souls are being nourished, so we truly can understand what God is calling us to for the next season of our lives. So, so thank you for, for sharing that. I'm going to hand back to Dom in a moment, but before we do that, Mark, it just uh, we'd love to hear a little bit about what's happening in New Wine at the moment, and, and to tell us a little bit about uh, United's breakout. So if we could just uh, get you to share that and then um, uh, hand over to Dom afterwards. Well, I mean, isn't, isn't this a wonderful thing? I mean, normally we have about 25,000 people come to our summer conference, and, and now it's going to be online on the first weekend of August, and it's free to everybody. And I'm so excited by that because it's like, Here's another thing the Lord's doing. It's the gifts of God for the people of God. And um, the churches that I'm a part of, we're going to be showing the new wine thing on a Sunday morning um, instead of our normal service. It'll be very different. But, but this, is a, this is an opportunity to share in uh, a, a global fam, Christian family some of the things of God. So new, new wine's about investing in leaders. That's what I do. I do a lot of mentoring of church leaders. Um, uh, that sounds like, a, sounds like I know what I'm doing, but the, the truth is in the mentoring of church leaders, you gather a group of leaders in a room together and you draw out the jewels and the gems that are in there because there are so, there's so much goodness that everybody has to share. Um, uh, we have a, 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 the youth and children's networks and, and we have um, uh, 
um, rural leaders networks and we have uh, other networks it's, it's just fantastic but i just i would say um united breaks out is a great opportunity to invite your church to connect with churches across the nation who are joining together in a particular style of worship and to uh, experience something different of the kingdom of god one of my one of the things that i have uh, uh graham i'm i i'm um a, a little while ago, the Bishop of London made me a prebendary of St. Paul's Cathedral, London. Now, don't really ask me what that means, but this is what it does mean. It means I go and preach in St. Paul's three or four times a year, and it's, it's great being part of that and being part of that community. It's really different from that that I experience in my local church. You come to my local church, we have a full band, we have, you know, everything's digital, it's all... It's, it's, it's quite high energy. I go to St. Paul's Cathedral, it's choral, it's deep, it's rich, it's different. They're both fantastic. They, it, it, they're really both. And so this, this United Break Sound Weekend, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday morning, is an opportunity over the first weekend of August to invite your church family to experience something different. And, um, I read something online um, a couple of days ago. Someone had put something up of, of, of some, a group of singers and they were singing, um, it was an Italian worship song actually. And um, the person who put it up said, um, please don't be critical. Everybody here is trying their best. Just celebrate what, this, what offering this is. And it was absolutely beautiful. And I hope that we can wouldn't that be beautiful if the church was like that? That around the country we celebrated all the different traditions and practices of enabling people to meet with the presence of God. And here's one, it's all free, first weekend of August. Join with us, we'd love to have you there. Fantastic, thank you so much to, to Graham and to Mark for an amazingly rich, conversation there we at your neighbor.org are really excited about united breaks out and um, i've just posted the link on the chat i'm looking forward to personally being a part of it and um, excited to um, be there online we're gonna we're gonna come back to um to mark and graham for questions in a moment so if you want to ask a question to either or both of them please do private message me at Dom Llewellyn in the chat and we'll ask them as many questions as possible and we'll be finished by 1.30. Um, we're very quickly now going to show you a video, uh, a very short video on what, what the amazing work that World Vision are doing around the world at this time and then Graham's going to share a tiny bit. When it comes to facing COVID-19, we're all fragile, but we're not equally fragile. As many as 30 million children's lives could be severely impacted by the secondary effects of COVID-19. They don't have the ability to practice social distancing. They don't have hospitals that they can go to. Most of the time, they don't even have proper hand washing facilities. If this virus gets to these camps, it's going to be catastrophic. is responding around the world to the COVID-19 pandemic. Creating isolation units and beds and testing facilities. To distribute food, education and hygiene kits. Partnering with the United Nations, with national governments. To reach 72 million people. It's World Vision's biggest emergency response in its 70 year history. We want to be in the world what we think Jesus Christ would be if he were here in the middle of all these problems and needs. 
time of need, oh Father God. Here we are, stepping out, Father God, out of the four walls. You know, the measure of what a man believes is what he does, and never more so than right now. For 70 years, the church has stood with World Vision. And those who serve need our support now more than ever. Together. 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 We can protect some of the world's most vulnerable children from coronavirus. Thank you. So I mentioned uh, before the prayer which, which World Vision was founded on, the prayer from Bob Pierce, who you would have seen on the video. May my heart be broken for the things which break the heart of God. And we certainly know and sense that God's heart is breaking for what we're seeing around the world. World Vision is working in around 100 countries uh, around the world. And uh, our Christian faith is the foundation of everything that we do. I don't know if you caught the start of that um, that video there, which just powerfully illustrates the impact that COVID-19 is having on communities. We saw the quote from the, the mother Fatima from Syria, and she says, I still recall the bombing in Syria and how scary it was, but you can hear the explosion and you can run away from it. But this virus is unseen and unheard. It is like an invisible weapon. And you have to ask yourselves, how do you wash your hands regularly when the queue for the water point is so long. And you have to ask yourself, how do you stay at home and be safe when your family will only eat if you can get out and earn money? These are really tough questions which children and communities are facing around the world right now. And uh, World Vision is a, a member of the Disasters Emergency Committee. You may have seen that we, uh, the DEC has launched an appeal last week to help communities like Fatima to overcome some of the issues which they are facing. Millions of parents around the world have no way to provide for their children and their families when uh, COVID hits in the way it is at the moment. So World Vision is there, World Vision is in these communities, World Vision is in these refugee camps providing food and other essential items to, to help people. We're supporting with mental well-being for, for children and their families. We're providing PPE to keep children safe and we're providing the health care and constantly we're scaling up our preventative measures uh, to, to help these communities deal um, with clean water, soap and hand washing, training um, essentials to helping fight um, the spread of coronavirus. We really believe and sense God has called World Vision, all of us at World Vision, to help with the most vulnerable children around the world. On, on a daily basis, we come together and we pray. We keep our eyes focused on the Lord and all that we do to ensure that we will not be shaken in our mission to uh, ensure that every child is able to live a full and happy life. And we do that not just ourselves, it's not just World Vision and, and, and above, we do this together. We do this together with people who support us, people who pray for us, people who work with us in, the, in both here in the UK and overseas. We do this with the communities and the children that we serve as well. And uh, I, I, I just wanna thank um, the, each of you for being involved in today's session, each of you for being involved in this week's sessions. I wanna thank uh, your neighbor, uh, just for the support um, uh, throughout this process. And, and I guess from World Vision's perspective, we know that together we are called, all of us called together to help um, the world's most vulnerable children. You'll be able to find out more, much more about World Vision's work uh, on the Your Neighbour website this week. So please go there just to find out and see some more videos and details about how you could be involved and see about our work. So thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much, Graham, and, and, and thanks so much, Mark. It's, it's wonderful to partner with World Vision this week. Really appreciate your support and to also be partnering with New Wine on this Leaders Lunch. We really appreciate working together with you. I've put the link to the video in the chat bar so you can see it there. We've got about 15 minutes left for, for questions and uh, we've had a few in, so really looking forward to hearing uh, Graham and Mark's answers to them. Hazel says this, 
Fantastic content and so helpful and challenging, especially on self-care. She's wondering, could you share any suggestions, advice or tools on how as senior leaders, we can look after those within our leadership teams well? All right. Uh, Graham, are you going to answer this? <laughs> I can. I, I can give a perspective, but Mark, and I'll give you a, a moment to to think about that. Um, I, I would say um, that this is a real issue. Um, as I said before, you would have thought at the start of lockdown that we're going to have so much free time because so many things have closed down. That has not been the case. What we're seeing is um, actually more opportunities than we ever thought. More opportunities to serve more needs around the world, and, and therefore more of a reason for us to be able to work out how we solve those problems. And, and I think one of the things which I, I've seen that has been another challenge is, as families have gone into lockdown, it means, it means that many of our staff have to work different hours. Uh, they're juggling childcare, they're juggling delivering school lessons, as well as, uh, as providing um, uh, for, for uh, delivering the work which they're called to do. So for us, we have provided a lot more flexibility for our staff, and I think that's been an important thing. So I see some of my staff checking in in the morning, checking out from work in the afternoon to check in fully to their children and families, and then maybe picking up emails in the evenings or weekends. Now, that's great, isn't it? It's great to be flexible. It's meant that families have been able to work through this and, and, and achieve both areas, but there's a real challenge around this. And I think that the challenge is that we have no boundaries and we never know when to, 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 to stop and to, uh, and, and to say enough is enough. And what we certainly see in World Vision is we will never ever be able to, to fulfill all the need that is there. A and it is more than ever important to be able to put boundaries around the work and to hold our staff to account and saying, no, it's not okay to keep responding to emails late in the, in the day or in the evening. It's, it's important that you switch off. It's important that you have time for yourself. It's important you have time for your families. And as Mark has so powerfully illustrated today, it is really important that first and foremost, we are creating time for us to be in God's presence and to hear from him. So that would be my, my strong advice to, 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 to pastor and to mentor and support your staff to, to, to create those boundaries where they know they can, can switch off. I know, uh, that's so that's so great great and that really is i i, I mean i um i would just uh, share with you the few things that i ask of my staff i mean a i'm very blessed to have staff but uh, i think the question was senior leaders which may be volunteers as well um and i um so all my senior staff i would say get um they have a day a month that is just for retreat. We've always done that. So I ask them to retreat with the Lord one day a month, whatever. Um, uh, but all, all those that who serve in any major way, I, I ask them about their sleeping habits, uh, their eating habits, their rest habits, and their reading habits. So, so what are they doing with their sleeping? Are they sleeping at night or are they full of anxiety and worry? And if so, can we help in that situation? Are they eating well? Are, are they practicing good eating habits? Because if they're not, they're probably worried about something or there's something on their mind. Comfort is going on. What, what is it about eating habits? Are they taking their time off? Um, and um, so in the, for example, in the day that I asked them to take each, each month to retreat with the Lord, um, they're not allowed to, that I say, please don't take phone or computer or any, just be with your heavenly father um, and reading habits. So I would encourage us to read a book together and to talk about it. Um, the reason for doing that is it, is it encourages people to read. Um, and uh, also we, we would, we would talk about reading a, um, a gospel or a, a letter in the New Testament and then sharing about that. So we would share an experience together, um, something that um, enables us to have a bit of a healthy lifestyle. And um, yeah, I, I think people work really hard in life and need looking after. And I, I think that's there's some of the key things that I would put in place. And, and of course you can't, 
put those in place unless you are doing them yourself. So you've got to practice these things. Um, and I love that. I love what Graham's just said about having flexible working habits. I think that's so important. And I think we, we can all have that and much more these days. And there's a great opportunity for children's time and, you know, family time and date nights with your wife and whatever it might be. So, so put those things in place. They're absolutely key. Or date nights with your husband. Sorry, I should make sure I get that right. Date nights with whoever you are married to or share life with or with your friends. Really, really uh, important. Forgive me for that. But it's... Um, I think these things are absolutely key. And I, I think if you look after your team, your team will be better equipped to look after others. Fantastic. Great answers. Thank you so much um, for that. And um, a, friend of, a friend of mine has a great saying, which I love, which is rest is a weapon. So uh, I, I think in terms of us being able to put on spiritual armor, just doing it from a place of rest and knowing, and I love what you talked about earlier, Mark, in terms of knowing whose you are as a child of God and everything flowing from that. So thank you so much. We've got, um, we've got a, another question here from Gareth and I'm going to ask um, Mark it, and then it'd be great if Graham could come in. He, he said he'd be interested in hearing any specific self care tips the bivocational leaders, so leaders who I guess are working both in the church and in the marketplace, and how staff teams can best interact with them and support them in their call. Thank, thank you, Gareth. That's a really great question. And um, I think that um, I, I really relate to this because I am bivocational. Um, uh, I, as a church leader and then as a leader of New Wine and as a trustee of Tear Fund, um, doing stuff around the world. So um, I think that uh, communication is the key thing. Um, how we communicate to each other, giving space to one another, allowing for one another. Um, I think that... Um, uh, adjusting for me adjusting staff meetings or gathering meetings that allow for people to be by bi vocational so um for some of my main leadership meetings where we have them in the evening we provide dinner for those who are out in the office throughout the day so that when they come there's something there for them and then they can still go home and have time with family i think also managing time of meetings um, uh, so starting on time and finishing on time so that people know where they are uh, with 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 space in their lives and um, I don't know if I'm sure you've never been in one of those meetings that's felt like it's going on far too long and we're really not doing very much. And you think we are wasting so many people's time. So for me, it's about saying we're going to make the most of this time and then having those offline talks afterwards. Um, but also having reasonable expectations of those who are, you know, trying to manage a job, a home, family, and ministry because you you've only got a limited amount of time that you can use for those things and so only asking it, it enough of you that you have ownership of it but also not expecting too much of you that we burn you out be the worst thing we could possibly do Graham, over to you yeah thank you mark i, I just want to build a couple of things on that. I, I, um, my initial thought came down to meetings and the way that we meet together and how that's changed so much. So the way I'm used to working, I'm used to working in an open plan office where I can just drop by and have a conversation with someone and, and ask, how are you doing? And, and you know, because you've got um, verbal as well as non-verbal cues to understand how someone's going. It's much harder to do that in the situation now. So uh, it's, you know, all my meetings happen on on zoom or on on teams and so it's just it's not really the normal thing it's just to call someone on a video and say how are you doing 
Um, so I think a lot of the kind of the, you, you miss a lot of how people are really doing. And so intentionally trying to work out with those people who you are working with is to build time into meetings, to build time for normal human interaction is something which I think I've been very conscious of because our meetings actually have start, start every time now on time. And we normally have very clear agendas because we're working remotely. And, and it's very easy for meetings to be purely, if you like, business focused and, and, um, and neglecting all human interaction. So creating some space, whether it's a net meeting or, and maybe it's just a lunchtime where we say, we're just gonna come together for half an hour and we're just gonna share about something that's happening. Also, I think one of the other opportunities that, that has come up through uh, lockdown is actually we're working from home and actually it sort of opens up our home life with our work life a lot more. So, uh, you know, I'm half expecting one of my daughters to come running through the door and bump in and interrupt the meeting. And, and that happens frequently in our meetings. And for that to be okay, for people not to feel pressured by that, to know that that's just part of the life we're leading has been, a, I think, a really important part of self-care. It removes stress and anxiety and it just enables us to be ourselves a lot more. The other thing I wanted just to feed in, and it kind of related to the last question as well, is one thing is intentionally looking for out uh, for people, people who have busy lives, people who have lives which are involved in multiple different things. The one thing I think has been our, one of our biggest challenges is getting our staff to be able to take holidays because normally we book our holidays out. We've been going away somewhere lovely and it's all booked in. That's all been thrown up in the air now. And I think one of the tendencies is to think, well, I'll just keep on working through. But as you mentioned before, Mark, a need to rest is even more important than ever. And so even if we're not going away somewhere lovely, actually to stay at home and have a complete chance to switch off and rest is so important for, for self-care of, uh, of all of us. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for that. Such a such a great question and wonderful answers. One thing that really struck me and a colleague as we were talking about six weeks ago was we suddenly realized that we were losing some of our short-term memory. And we, we realized that it was due to stress. And we were wondering, why are we so stressed? And one of the reasons we landed on was the fact that we looked at our diaries and we were doing 10 Zooms a day with no gaps in between. So if we were in London, for example, or wherever else, we'd be walking in between meetings. And it just struck me that I personally needed to make a change and actually make sure that in between meetings, I gave myself a bit of space to just decompress and to, to rest, to pray, to think about the next meeting instead of just unfortunately zooming from meeting to meeting, uh, no pun intended. Um, Graham and Mark, thank you so much for just a wonderful uh, conversation and um, a really rich discussion. Really grateful to you both for, for that. Really also very grateful to World Vision and New Wine for partnering with us here at yourneighbor.org. Tomorrow, we've got a leader's lunch with, Pat, with Patrick Regan and the link is coming up now in the, on, the, on the chat. And he's from Kintsugi Hope and he'll be talking on the church and mental health and it'd be great to see you there. Um, and Mark, I was wondering if you'd be okay to end by praying for us. Oh, it'd be a pleasure. Father, thank you for yourneighbor.org and this amazing organization and all that it does. Thank you for World Vision and um, the way in which it is reaching out to and helping those most in need around the world. And Lord, as we are together, we want to pray for that DEC appeal, that it would be really significant and that we as a nation, as a world, would respond um, to the greatest needs. And Lord, I want to pray that you would bless each of us as well, that we would um, protect our hearts and minds, that we as leaders would know something of your grace and favor and goodness in our lives. That we wouldn't just be sharers of strategy and vision and, and future, but we'd be people who are bringers of the presence of almighty God, who can change all things. And help us, Lord, to have ears that are tuned, to listen to the whisper of your spirit, as you speak to us for the health of our own souls 
and for the health of our churches and for the health of our nation and this world. So Lord, put your blessing and hand upon each and every one of us, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks especially to Graham and to Mark, and we look forward to seeing you soon, and have a lovely rest of your day.